This is the Anglican Way 3, Return of the Anglican Way, um, or Revenge of the Anglican Way if it's episode 3. Um, that's a Star Wars joke. It wasn't very funny though. Um, first week we talked about like philosophy. We had that kind of compass rose thing we did, right? And then last week we did history. Like 2,000 years of history. Uh, and then, now this week, we're doing essential theology. Isn't that exciting? Ooh. Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> what could be more exciting? So, a few hundred years ago, it was decided this was a great, great way to teach people about religion, right? Was to ask the questions and the answers, question, answer, answer, answer. Um, the Anglican Church has this catechism. Um, this is the historic catechism. There have been... Other catechisms within the Anglican world since then, but this is the this is the original. This is the one I like to I like to go over with folks. Um, the everyone's getting catechisms. Look at this. <laughs> this thing is designed for seven year olds. Okay, like that's who's designed for. Because in the Anglican Church in like the 1600s, the people who got confirmed were about seven. So this is theology for seven-year-olds. Now, you're gonna now now, now that I've told you that you're gonna read it and say like, wow, these seven-year-olds had a way higher <laughs> <laughs> reading ability than I had when I was seven, and that may or may not be true. But that's who it's designed for. Now, one of the great things about the Ang the Catechism of the Anglican Church is this is the entire thing, right? It's four pieces of paper, like two pieces of paper, double-sided, and that is twelve point times Roman. Right? Like, so it's really short. I have in my office, I have the Westminster Catechism, Presbyterian Catechism, and it's way thicker than this. I have also the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it's way thicker than this. Um, the reason I bring that up is that there's something about a short catechism that says something about your church. Right? What it says is, we're not that concerned with getting every single thing right. Like, crossing every T, dotting every I. We're not interested in going through every single possible question that you might possibly have. You know, We'd rather just do this and see how this goes, and then we'll figure things out as we go. Right? That's kind of what we're saying. Okay. So, um, so that's why this exists. The purpose of the catechism is to, is to teach the essential theology of the church, and that's why I wanted to... That's why I want to. That's why it's helpful to, to use. I'm not going to like read this thing to you or the whole thing to you. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I want to talk about uh, these essential theological elements. And one of the things I want you to consider for a moment is um, many of you are coming from other Christian traditions. Um, some of you aren't, but some, many of you are. Consider for yourself what would be on the catechism in your Christian tradition that you grew up in. Right? What would be the important things, right? Um, what would they want to make sure that you knew? And it's kind of a fun thing to do to mentally compare and contrast what this catechism really thinks that you need to know versus other things you need to know. And what you're going to find is that this thing is very kind of in that center point, like we talked about, that kind of, you know, it doesn't veer off into, it's not, like, doesn't veer off into evangelical land or charismatic land or orthodox land or, you know, Catholic land or liberal land or conservative land. It's just very, very simple, right? Uh, and, and very kind of um, specific, specific to this tradition, but at the same time, could probably be used by the traditions too, right? And they probably wouldn't freak out. Okay. Um, here's the here's like one of my favorite parts of the entire catechism, which is the very first question, which is, "What is your name?" <laughs> now, I, I mean that, right? What is your name? And then, my name is. Indian, because it's little British kids in the 16th century, right? <laughs> My name is John Harold, or whatever. <laughs> Who gave you this name? My godfather. Uh, anyway, sorry. My godfathers and godmothers in my baptism. Wherein, by God's grace, I received the sacrament of new birth, entered the family of Christ's church, and became an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So let's talk about that for just a second. All right? Um, in the Bible, names are really important. Okay? And having a name, giving a name, that's a really big deal. 
Um, because in the scripture, like, if you have the right to name somebody, you own that thing. Like, if you name it, you own it. Right? It's yours. So Adam in the Garden of Eden going around naming the animals, it shows that he dominates the animals. Right? And so, just as a total aside, I don't know if you ever noticed, that in that, in that Genesis story, uh, he doesn't name his wife until after the fall. Right? Like, before the fall, he says, oh, that's her, and I'm him. That's interesting. And then after the fall, he's like, and then I named her Eve. Right? Because at that moment, he's like, now I'm owning you. Right? So there's this thing that happens when names happen. It's like, you belong to me. Right? And so the beginning question is really interesting in that context. Like, who gave you this name? My, God, my godparents gave me this name. In other words, there's, from the very beginning of the catechism, there's this idea that the community that you belong to the community. That if you're, that the, the Anglican person belongs to the rest of them. Right? That there is no, that there's not a sense in which um, as a Christian you get to be like this sort of, as my professor in, at school said, uh, you're, you, can't, you can't be the absolute sovereign self. And then you do the first letter of each of those words. Um, you can't be the absolute sovereign self. Right? You have, you are part of a group. You're part of a community. And your identity comes in part from that community. That community gets to voice what you are. Okay? Now, that is a, not a very American concept. right? Uh, it's not a very democratic concept. It's not a, it's not a concept that we are particularly comfortable with. But it's a firmly ancient world concept. And it's a biblical concept. It's a Christian concept. That we, there's something that, in other words, that we, we are part of each other. And it's not acceptable to... Just be like, oh, I, I'm an independent actor. I do as I please, right? Um, and that's in the very beginning. And notice also that when they say who, who named you, it doesn't say my mom and my dad, my godmother and my god, my godmothers and my godfathers. In other words, yeah, your parents. I'm sure if they were alive, right? But also, like the people who your parents thought were important to them. Okay, so there's this whole community aspect to who you are in Christ um, that's really important. Um, and then this part which makes some people very uncomfortable um, in my baptism wherein by God's grace I received the sacrament of new birth entered the family of Christ's church and became inheritor of the kingdom of heaven okay now remember that the people who are saying this most of them are baptized as babies there are people who are baptized as, who are baptized as adults in the tradition we don't, we don't discriminate against you based on your age when we baptize you right so whatever age you are is totally fine now, some people, uh, people who you come from like baptistic traditions where you have to be of a certain age to get baptized, this is the part that freaks them out, right? Because you go, what? Right? Totally understand. I get that completely. And I just want to say a couple things to you. Um, I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise, but let me just say a couple things. One is that this has been the tradition of the church since the Bible, right? That in the scripture, entire families are baptized, and when an entire family is baptized, that means everybody. Right? Mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, slaves, kids, 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 everyone. Okay. So from the beginning, we've been baptizing babies. There is no record of a debate within the church as to whether or not children should be baptized until, until the Reformation. Okay. So at no point did any of the great theologians of the past go, wait a minute, what are we doing? Right? Why, are we, why are we doing this? Everyone just... Assumed, and the reason we assumed it is because we did not have a, a sense of humanity as a bunch of individuals. We had a sense of humanity as group, right? And because we have a sense of, of humanity as group and community, we don't see you as having this like superpower to decide what you're going to do with your life. I know, wild, right? Crazy. The other thing that goes that goes on is that um, baptism is a sacrament of grace, right? And so. In our understanding, grace is not something that you can get. So you don't get to decide to have grace. You know, you don't, that's not your option. You don't get to say, okay, now I want grace. You know, grace is something that is given to you. Right? It's unmerited favor. And because it's unmerited, uh, what bat, the baptism of a baby is a great symbol for the rest of us of unmerited favor. Because what it says is, look, here's somebody who did nothing to get this. And guess what? They're accepted into the kingdom of heaven. Because 
because they are. Um, that's, that's like our position. And then um, are there, there, but like I said, I think in the first week, are there people who go to this church who don't agree with what I just said? Absolutely. Right? Totally fine. Okay? Um, you're not going to make a good Anglican priest, but if that's not what you're trying to be, whatever. Okay? Um, struggle with that yourself. Um, are you guys cold? Is it cold again? Yes. All right. You should say something, people. Oh, look at this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, does anyone want to ask questions, kickback, feedback, desire to not like that, unlike on Facebook button? Right. Oh, how, how we like getting baptized again? Uh, we think that if you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're done. That there's no, like, that's it. Grace has been conferred, you've been baptized, or out. Um, and so. I, have, I would not ever, and none of us would, hopefully, knowingly rebaptize somebody. Now, we have had, I, I've never done one, but there is something called conditional baptism, because there are people who don't know if they were baptized. Like, that does happen, you know. Um, oh, wait a minute, no, I did do a conditional baptism. I, forgive me, yes, I did do a conditional baptism. And it was someone who was adopted who was from Africa. And we did not know if this person had been baptized as a, as a child or not, or as a baby. And so... That we say, if you have not been baptized before, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's like kind of legal or something. Um, but like I said, we wouldn't knowingly rebaptize somebody because we feel like once is completely fine and totally good enough. And, and we also, um, some people would argue, well, I didn't, my parents didn't really believe, or the minister was a jerk, or you know, all these kind of things. Um, it's totally reasonable. But we we actually have in what we call the Articles of Religion. Um, we have an article about that. It's called On the Unworthiness of the Ministers. And essentially what it's, it says is that the, that the validity of the sacrament is not dependent on the worthiness of the minister. Because if the validity of the sacrament is dependent on the worthiness of the minister, you are all in big trouble. <laughs> because basically you've never had communion in this church. Because if it was based on my worthiness for you to get communion, right? Like, you're done, because <laughs> I'm not worthy, okay? Um, in the same way, the people who baptized this baby were not worthy, you know? Whether they were like, oh, we're really in, on fire for the Lord, or they were like, whatever, here we go, baptize your name of Christ. You know, we just think that God does something in that. And that is crazy and wild, but he just seems to do it, so. Yes? Yeah, this, every tradition has to wrestle with that question, which is like, okay, what happens to the, the previously baptized who now reject Christ, right? And this, by the way, is a huge problem in, in the Baptist church, right? Because of the once saved, always saved kind of doctrine that, like, I personally know people who are atheists who were baptized when they were 12 in a Baptist church. But they're like, once saved, always saved, what are you going to do? Ha, 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 right? So um, that's, that becomes an issue, right? Um, I would, in, in our tradition, what I would say is that um, your baptism brings you into the Ark of Christ Church, that whole thing. And whenever we baptize someone, we're making a faith statement. You know, we're saying that we believe that you are now part of the Christ Church and you're going to be forever part of Christ Church and not everything else. 
And I could certainly see people rejecting Jesus and therefore taking off. Right? But our go, the way we go into it is with, is with faith. We make a faith statement. We're like, okay, now you're in it. If you decide that you want to reject Jesus and do something else, fine. Right? Um, it, it's very dangerous to judge whether someone else is going to heaven or not. You know what I mean? Like, that's something that I don't, I'm not really interested in doing. Uh, but I would say, like, in the Bible, if you reject Jesus, pretty much that's a bad way to start with the whole afterlife deal, right? Um, like, you know, I don't, you know, it's like that doesn't seem like a good idea to me um, because there's some, you know, language about that. And, and I don't know how an entire life is going to go. Like, I don't know, like, how God sees that. I don't know, like, if God, like, cares or how he deals with people who kind of go back and forth in their faith. And I, I have no idea, and I'm glad I don't get to make those decisions. Uh, but I would say I think it's I think it's necessary for someone who was baptized as a baby to have a have, have to come to a living faith in Christ as an adult. And I think it's important to come to a living faith in Christ, like when you're 20, and then when you're 30, and when you're 40, and when you're 50. I think that having a living faith in Christ is is very very necessary. And my assumption is that it's necessary for salvation, right? Like, you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Like, you believe in your heart, that, you know, you confess with your mouth that Jesus, that God, ah, Jesus Christ is the Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. There's a couple of, like, you will be saved if you do this kind of statements. And my assumption is you need to do those statements. Like, those are important things, right? Because I don't think that Romans is kidding, you know, when it says that kind of stuff. Um, and I believe that baptism is the sacrament of new birth. So, um, so one way I, I kind of express this to people is one of, one of my favorite ways of understanding baptism or understanding salvation at all, really, is, um, is adoption, right? Um, I think adoption is a great image. And the question I ask is, at what point is a child adopted, right? Like, is the child adopted when the parents decide they want to have a child? Is a child adopted when they first see the child in the orphanage? Is a child adopted when they come home for the first time? Is a child adopted? Which court proceeding is it that actually adopts a child? Right? Uh, are they adopted when they first call you mommy or daddy? Are they adopted when they graduate from school and you like send them off to college? Are they adopted when you walk them down the aisle? Are they adopted when they bury you? Like at what point are they adopted? You know? And I would say all of those are adoption. Like there's a process there. Now Probably, if you want to get really technical, it's when they, you, there's some kind of signature is required, and that's probably the moment. You know what I mean? But I don't know if that signature required doesn't always feel like the moment, and it's like part of a huge process. And so to me, baptism is like the signature part. It's like this is when, okay, if we're going to get really technical, this is the moment. Right? This is the salvation moment. But salvation is a huge thing. Right? It's not just that. It's like God's constant interaction with me, where he is constantly saving me, constantly redeeming me, constantly justifying me, constantly bringing me from one state to another, you know, and I'm fighting against him the entire time, basically. So, yeah. John, are you going to talk about confirmation as a separate subject, or does confirmation in some distant way relate to the subject you're talking about? Yeah, it does, because... It does, but let's talk about confirmation when I talk about the other things. Okay. And <laughs> just talk about baptism for like 20 minutes, <laughs> which is great. And I did not intend to talk about it for 20 minutes, but there it is. All right. Okay. Well, let's then. then so that's one thing. Um, so if we're talking about theology, then the th important theological points are that we begin uh, where we have to begin, which, which is with you, right? The first conversation in theology is, okay, what's your deal? And the first thing we say about you is you belong to others. And then, after we say you belong to others, we say, and these others brought you to Christ. And so you belong to Christ. Right? You are part of this deal. Um, and you are, if you keep reading that a little bit where it says beginning, um, we also ask you to engage in this. Right? This is not just you're baptized and then you're out. Right? You're baptized, and now you're part. So, be part. Okay? 
Um, the next bit is the Apostles' Creed. Um, and the reason we use the Apostles' Creed is the Apostles' Creed is the creed that the West, the, La the Latin-speaking part of, uh, of the church world, that the West has always used for baptisms. Um, it's, the, it's the baptismal creed. Um, it's not the creed of the universal church, which is the Nicene Creed, which we say on Sunday, but it's the baptismal creed. And so the reason for this Apostles' Creed is because in the early development of the church, you need to understand that Christians didn't invent baptism. Like, we didn't come up with that. Jews were already baptizing people. Uh, pagans were already baptizing people. Like, baptism is something that is, like, part of the gestalt of the universe. You know, people kind of like that. And so when we baptize somebody, it's not, it's, we can't just put someone in the water and bring them up and don't say anything. Because we need to, we need to talk about the God into which we are baptizing this person. Like, what do we, what does this mean? And so our statement of that is the Apostles' Creed. And so the Apostles' Creed is written there for you. Um, uh, let's see if I need to comment on any of it. Um, I think that the part, of, the part that people ask me about more than any other part is the part that says the Holy Catholic Church. That's the one where people go, oh, I don't understand. Okay. Ca uh, the, the word Catholic um, essentially means universal, but it has, another, it, has, it has a deeper meaning than that, and that's why we don't change it. Um, it means universal in the sense that there is only one church on earth. Okay? So while it looks like the body of Christ is divided into many, many churches, we believe there's actually only one church. Uh, there's, and that, not that... And it's not the Anglicans are the one true church. It means that everybody who has been baptized in the name of the Trinity is part of this church. Okay? Unless you like to take off, I guess. So, so there's one church. Also, the church is for everyone. Okay? So there's no such thing as a church. I'm about to get in trouble. Uh, there's no such thing as a church for young people. Right? Because that's not a Catholic church. Right? So therefore, it's not Catholic. Therefore, it's not a church. Um, it has to be universal. So there's not a church for white people, right? That would not be Catholic, <laughs> okay? So the church, is for, the church is open to everyone. The church, is, the church embraces everyone. There's no one who's outside of the possibility of, of being part of the ministry of the church. Um, so that's what most people ask about. Um, and then there's the descent into dead and descent into heaven. The reason that that is in there is because it's the baptismal creed. That's why the, the, the Apostles' Creed talks about that. Because he wants to talk about Look, you are going to descend into the water, and then you're going to ascend out of the water. It's like you're going into death, and now you're coming into life. And in the creed, it wants to point out that that's what Jesus did, too. That's why it's in the Apostles' Creed and not in the Nicene Creed, because the Nicene Creed is not that particularly interested in that bit. But that's why it's there, and why it gets, uh, gets some love. What, what's the, the communion of saints? Uh, what, does that, what does that really look like and mean? You know, is it <clears throat> I'm not understanding that? Um, the communion of saints means that there is one communion, there's one group, there's one community in union of people who are in Christ, the saints of the people who are in Christ, um, that, and that includes all the living and the dead. So everyone who's alive, who's in Christ, is part of the communion, but so are all those who are dead, they're part of the communion, and there's a sense in which even those who have not been born are part of the communion. So there's one communion of saints. So there's not many communions of saints. There's not like a, a greater group and a lesser group. You know, or like, these are the cool people. These are the not cool people. There's no separation. There's one communion of saints. Um, and it reminds us that the, that the living and the dead are both part of this, part of the team. You know, that, there's no, that there is no separation. The, the separation that we see, the separation that exists between the living and the dead is a separation that exists for us but doesn't exist for anyone else. Right? Exists for the living, doesn't exist for them. Certainly doesn't exist for God. He doesn't care. <coughs> and so we're all part of the same. <coughs> Anyone else? Apostles Creed questions? Awesome. Okay. So, so here's something funny about the, the oh the Apostles Creed is super Trinitarian, right? There's three really important I believe. In fact, there's. There's three times where it says, I believe in the creed, right? I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Okay. 
So the, the Trinity is essential, essential Anglican doctrine, right? Because it's essential Christian doctrine. Uh, we would say that if a church does not hold the Trinity, it is not a Christian church, like by definition. So that's that's where we hit. The, that's our dividing line, you know. That in the nature of Christ, like if Christ is not fully human and fully God, you're not a Christian church. If <laughs> Christ, if there is no Trinity, you're not a Christian church. So that's where we, that's where we separate. Um, which is a pretty wide separation of what a Christian church is, by the way. Um, okay, so th then there's a little unpacking, which I'm not going to read, about what is what does this uh, important teaching mean uh, for you. Okay, so then what happens is we get to go into law and gospel. Right? Um, you stated earlier the Ten Commandments. You stated earlier that that your godfathers and godmothers promised on your behalf that you would keep God's commandments. Tell me how many are there ten? Which are they? Um, now, don't get entirely freaked out that it just says that there are ten commandments and then you go, wait a minute, didn't Jesus give us another commandment? All the time? Yes. Okay. And if you were to continue to read where it starts to unpack these commandments, it pretty much tells you everything you could, that you have to do. Right? Like all the rules are there in case you're interested. Right? Like... You know, my, what's my duty towards God? What's my duty towards my neighbor? There's all kinds of things about, like, obedience and not coveting and, you know, pleasing God and the laws of the state and, like, the whole, the whole thing. Um, the, the Ten Commandments are the, um, are the parameters of morality. Um, is something, in, can something be immoral and not be found in the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. <laughs> right? The Ten Commandments are kind of like a, are a, a guideline. You know, not in the sense of like, but you can break a few of them. And that's what I mean. What I mean is that these are hard and fast, these, these Ten Commandments. And they talk about more than they're talking about. Right? Uh, and which is what Jesus does with them. Right? Jesus says, well, you were told, do not murder. But I tell you, if you hate your brother, you're murdering him in your heart. You've been told... Do not commit adultery. I tell you, if you look at a woman lustfully, you commit adultery within your heart. So, like, that's the like the, the standard. Like, Jesus takes these Ten Commandments and just like blows them up and makes them outrageous. Right? It makes them harder, uh, way harder than they were before. Um, okay. I'm just gonna assume that you all can read the Ten Commandments. You probably know what they are, and you're okay. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Um, but here's okay. So here's the cool part. This is, this is one of the great parts of the catechism. I love that we're blazing through this, by the way. Um, okay. So you've, like, let's say you've gone through this. You're like the little British kids. It's, you know, it's the 17th century, you know. And you've been like, what is your duty towards your neighbor? My duty towards my neighbor is to love him or her. I love myself. Blah, 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 blah. Right? It's been going on. And it's pretty heavy. If you read this whole Ten Commandments thing and then all the, like, way they unpack it after, it's like they ain't kidding around. You know, like it's very, very heavily, like here's some moral stuff that you've got to do, right? Includes like, uh, bear no malice or hatred in my heart towards others. I love this one. To keep my hands from pilfering and stealing. Or <laughs> keep my hands from pilfering. Um, my tongue from speaking evil, telling lies, slandering others. Keep my body under self-restraint by acting soberly. This is the page of the first of the Lord's it. By acting soberly and purely not to cover the desire what belongs rightfully to others and do my duty where God shall place me today and in the future in whatever he calls me to do. You go. <laughs> now, if you have, unless you are incredibly self-righteous, you should get to that point and go, oh my gosh, I'm in deep, deep trouble. Okay? Like, if you're self-righteous, then you're not. You're like, oh yeah, of course. You know. <laughs> no problem. I... I had dinner once with somebody who will go unnamed. Who, um, we were, religion came up, which I always hate when that happens. And, <laughs> and the guy says, Well, I just think, you know, my religion is just I just keep the Ten Commandments. And I almost said, Name them. But I didn't. <laughs> but let me just say that I know for a fact this guy, <laughs> he, he, he is incredibly self righteous. That's what I'm trying to say. So people, some people are incredibly self righteous, and they hear the Ten Commandments and they go, Oh, yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, so you've done this. You should be realizing that you're in trouble. And then the, the part where it says the Lord's Prayer. The minister says, you need to know 
that you are not able to do these things in your own strength. And you cannot walk in the commandments of God and serve him without his special gracious help. Therefore, you must learn to ask for the help from God daily in prayer and especially for the regular saying of the Lord's Prayer. So this is what we call, this is the, this is the law gospel thing, right? This is how you know that, that, um, that like Martin Luther had something to say, like that there's like the, the shadow, the specter of Martin Luther is behind this catechism, right? Because, the, because Luther, one of Luther's great contributions to Christianity was this understanding of law gospel, which, by the way, like St. Augustine seemed to have, and like, you know, it's not like he made this up, all right? But he said, he, he said in a really good way, right? What he said was that the, that the law has two purposes. Uh, the first purpose is to show you, like, how awful you are, right? You should look at the law and say, wow, I suck. Like, that should be your response to the law. If your response is, I'm cool, good for you, right? But you should look at it and say, like, oh, my gosh, I'm so, I'm so done, right? And the second aspect of the law is um, you should say, you, sh you should realize how great Christ is, right? Because Christ was able to obey all those laws. So you suck. Christ is great, right? <laughs> kind of is what Luther said. And also, Christ has the ability to save you because you need a savior, Right? That's the deal. Like, you need a savior. And everyone does. Not just you. Me. Everyone does. Because we cannot obey the law. Therefore, since God's rules, God's law is so difficult because his law is perfection, and we are unable to be perfect. Therefore, we need somebody to rescue us. Because without a rescuer, we're done. Right? And that's what this is saying. Like, you cannot do this. Okay? Uh, but then also the specter of John Calvin is in this as well. Because what John Calvin says is, there's a third use of the law, Martin, which is the law shows us how to, how to, how to behave. Right? So it's not just there to say you suck and Christ is great. It's also there to say, and now you know, live this way. Like, do good. Right? And so this, like, the specter of John Calvin is also. Right? Because it says, like, you can't do this without God's gracious help. It implies that God might give you the help to someday, so once in a while, act this way more or less, right? Which is awesome. So sometimes we'll be able to do this, but only with God's gracious help. Uh, and when we are not able to, which is a when and not an if, um, then Christ is available to forgive us. Uh, so therefore, you have to learn how to pray. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna receive God's grace, you need to learn to ask for it. Um, which is, once again, is like baptism. <laughs> it comes back to like the infant baptism thing. Like, you don't get something unless God gives it to you. Like that's the that's what grace is about. You don't get something unless God gives it to you. And so, if you want grace to be able to live in a faithful way, you're going to need to learn how to pray. And the Lord's prayer is a great way to learn how to pray. Right. And so it has. Um, therefore, therefore you must learn to ask for His help daily in prayer, and especially for the regular saying of the Lord's prayer. Can you recite this prayer? The Lord's prayer is, and then they say the Lord's prayer. Okay. So. Um, So, anyway, so, do I have to, Lord's Prayer talk? Anybody want to talk about the Lord's Prayer? Heard it? Been there? Been there, done that. So, <laughs> good. Huh? You just give it the commandments. Yeah, just take it. I'm good with the commandments. It's cool. Um, I think it's interesting to look at the, the bit after the Lord's Prayer where it says, what do you desire from God in this prayer? So let's look at that for a second, because I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I desire my Lord God, our Heavenly Father, who is the giver of all goodness, to send his grace to me and to all people, that we may worship him, serve him, and obey him, as we ought to do. Also, I pray to God that he will send us all that we need, both for our souls and bodies, and that he'll be merciful to us, forgive us our sins, and that we please him to save and defend us in all spiritual and physical dangers, and that he will keep us from all sin and wickedness, from the snares of the devil, and from everlasting death. And all this I trust he will do because of his mercy and goodness through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, I say, Amen, so be it, Lord. Right? In other words, the Anglican way is about grace. Ugh. Right? Because all that comes from God. And he, like, you're not, you're not going to earn any of that. Right? This is like the gracious work of God. That he's going to do all this, like, saving work. Um, 
and save you from like sin, wickedness, spiritual, physical dangers, like the whole bit. Okay. Um, and that's what we need. So, anyway, so that's what we need to ask for. Okay. We are, we are so awesome right now. So the two sacraments. Um, since we, we actually do have time now. Um, the, in the history of the church, there's, um, well, let's talk about sacraments first. Okay. Um, sacrament, sacrament is something that some of you, it depends on what tradition you come from. Right, when you think about sacrament. If you come from the Roman Catholic tradition, Orthodox, Lutheran, something like that, Presbyterian, um, then sacrament is something that, like, okay, that might resonate with you. If you come from another tradition, more evangelical tradition or something else, sacrament may not resonate with you. Um, sacrament is this, sacrament is this belief that God meets us in the physical world. Okay? That there's a that there's an interaction that takes place between the Holy Spirit and us and the physical world. Um, and this, the idea of sacrament betrays an entire theological system. Okay. To have the idea of sacrament, you have to have, there's a, there's a much bigger theology behind it. And that bigger theology is that um, God is, God and his creation are different things. The creation is not made up of God's stuff. Okay. If you believe that the creation and God are the same thing, you're what we call a panentheist. Okay. Uh, so there are, you know, a couple, there's a couple of Eastern religions that are panentheist and, you know, everything else. But, so, we don't think that God and creation are the same thing. And we don't think that God is very, is removed from his creation. Right, so we're, he's not the same thing. But, that that Christ fills all things. Right? So the, the, the indwelling presence of God is here for everyone, everywhere. That there, is no, that there is no space in creation without God. So, because of that, um, the, the physical world, the created world, is really important. Uh, it's an, and it's so important that God did some serious sacramental work. What a sacrament is generally defined as is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Right? So the outward and visible sign is the part you see, the inward and spiritual grace is the part you do not see. Okay. So the first sacrament um, of God is creation. That's the first sacrament. That he would create that he would make an outward and visible sign of his inward and spiritual grace. The, so the first sacrament is creation. The great sacrament of God is is the incarnation, the outward and visible sign of the inward and spiritual grace, that Jesus is the Son of God, 100% God, 100% man. He's both things at the same time. Right? But that's the great sacrament. So the, the two great sacraments really are creation and the incarnation. Okay? So when we, start, when we talk about sacrament, that's the, that's the big theology behind that. And when you have that big theology then what happens is you cannot divorce, um, you can't divorce soul from body. You can't divorce what is happening here from what's happening in your soul. Um, and this divorce between soul and body or between the spiritual life and the physical life is one of the, is one of the great heresies of the ancient church and it's one of the great heresies of this, of this age. That the, what we do physically makes no difference and it's all about like what's in your which I could go off on, but I'm not going to go off on. So I'm not going to rant. But, so there's that. So out of that, out of this understanding of, of, of grace in the physical world, is this understanding that Christ assigned two sacraments. Like he specifically said, I'm going to do this sacrament and I'm assigning it to you. Right? And the two sacraments that he specifically gave us were baptism and communion. Okay. Um, now, the church also has five other sacramental acts that we have uh, participated in throughout the centuries, and we, and we and are biblical and are really awesome, but Christ did not specifically say, do this, right? Uh, and those 
sacramental acts are, let's see, Thomas is quizzing himself, uh, marriage, confirmation, ordination, um, healing, which is unction, um, and reconciliation, sometimes called confession. Those are the five sacramental acts. In all those five sacramental acts, this church participates in. Like those are the five. Those five great sacramental acts are available to every to everyone who wants them uh, in this church, right? Because they're part of our tradition. The Anglican Church, though, doesn't use the word sacrament for those because we we like to define sacrament as outward visible sign, an inward spiritual grace given by Christ. Right? We like to put throw on the given by Christ part. Okay. Um, now that said. Um, those are not the only five sacramental acts. In my, in, in, in my opinion, there are, a, there are billions of sacramental acts. Like, there are billions of ways. And I'm not, I'm not kidding when I say billions. There are billions of ways in which God confers grace to people through the physical world. You know, like, God confers grace when two friends like, hug each other. God confers grace when someone reads the Bible out loud. God confers grace when someone looks up at the stars and is overwhelmed with a sense of God's love. Like, God confers grace in the physical world all the time. Um, but those are the two and five, seven that we like to kind of codify. Right? But there's a ton of others. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes. So in the Last Supper, <clears throat> we, have, yes. we have the Last Supper. Right? Yes. Uh, and, but he also washes the disciples. Yes. He says, do these things in remembrance of me. What do you do for washing? Well, he doesn't actually tell us to keep, to keep washing in his feet in remembrance of him. So... Um, the, the church very early on did, did not see foot washing as, sac as a sacrament. You know, now there are there are Christian groups who do see it as a sacrament, and I had no problem thinking it was like a sacramental act or whatever else. And I think that foot washing is awesome. We do it here once a year um, in the Monday Thursday service, so we do participate in that particular action, but we don't see it as sacrament. The, the historic church didn't see it as sacrament, um, but I think there's a good argument you know, to be made. But he does not tell us to continue doing. So, that's why. <laughs> There's all kinds of other stuff that Jesus did that we don't continue. We don't curse fig trees generally. <laughs> we don't clean out the temple with money changers. You know, no, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm being funny, but I'm not being funny. Like, there's a lot of things that Jesus did that were really cool that we could do. Like, we could have a sacrament of fig tree cursing. We just don't have that, you know? And it wouldn't be bad, <laughs> you know, because it kind of is a cool symbolic um, and I like cursing. <laughs> We're not being recorded. So, um, so there's that. Okay. So does that make sense? You got the, the sacrament thing? Sacrament deal? All right. Well, let's talk about the sacrament of communion then for 10 minutes. Um, sacraments auth authorized by Christ. Last page. We've already talked about baptism. Uh, this has more about baptism and why do we do it with it. In fact, the question is like, why is it, you know, why do we baptize anybody? Why are infants baptized? All that kind of stuff is in there and you can just take a look at that. We've already kind of talked about it. Um, why the sacrament of the Lord's Supper ordained by Christ? For the continual remembrance of the sacrifice of the death of Christ and of the benefits we receive from his sacrifice. And then what are the outward signs? What's the inward grace? Um, the strengthening and refreshing of our souls by the body and blood of Christ as our, as our bodies are by bread and wine. And then a, a thing about examination. Um, okay, so let me give you the, the Anglican rundown on communion, which I'm sure you're fascinated by. Um, in the church, there's essentially been three ways to understand what happens when communion happens. Okay? Um, one way is the way that comes from the more kind of like low Protestant um, like kind of evangelical understanding of the universe, which is um, which is the, the, the group of, of, of Christians who don't believe in sacraments at all, right? And they, they call them ordinances, right? So an ordinance, in other words, is a rule. So Jesus gave us these rules, and one of the rules was you need to take this bread and wine, you need to say, you know, say these words, and then eat it together, <laughs> right? So we do that because it's a rule. Um, the folks who believe that it's a rule typically believe that it's important because Jesus said to do it, right? 
they typically don't believe that anything specifically is going on, right? That there's a, uh, that you might have a, a spiritual experience or an emotional experience and it's important, but, you know, there's not anything really going on. In the same way that, like, baptism is important, but nothing happens. Does that make sense? That's the, what's, that's the ordinance understanding. Okay. Um, the other side of the, of the camp is the sort of Roman Catholic understanding, um, which is that there's, a, um, that, there's a, that there's a sort of a literal sense in which the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. Uh, sometimes called transubstantiation, that may or may not be actually a fair expression. Um, so those are, the two, those are two traditions within the church. Uh, both of them end up like there's all kinds of pastoral implications to both of those traditions. Uh, the Anglican Church, typically Anglicans um, aren't kind of really down with either one of those. Right? Typically, what we're down with is the understanding that Christ is mystically present in the bread and wine. That, he is, that we are in fact eating his body and blood. But we don't really know what that means. Doesn't that sound Anglican to you? Um, like that we cannot kind of codify and put our finger on what exactly it is we're talking about. Because it seems to be beyond us somehow to understand that. So um, the Roman Catholics have a, a, a great, like they have a, they have a philosophical system of what they mean by that. You know, um, the kind of... Uh, well, Protestant, they have a, a philosophical system of what they mean is not going on, <laughs> right? Um, we kind of have a not really greatly worked out system. It's more of like, okay, th this is happening, but what exactly is happening? We're receiving the body and blood of Christ, and we're being strengthened in our inner selves. We are becoming one with Christ and one with each other, but I don't know how that works out as far as like, when it comes down to atoms, you know, and what it means and everything else. I, and I get the heebie-jeebies thinking about how to, how to do that. Yeah? So that's actually what I was going to say. I feel like I cringe every time I hear the word bread and butter because I don't get why we are supposed to be eating his body and his blood. That's just really confusing to me. So well, all of the things we're asked to believe at this point, mm -hmm. I think that is like the hardest thing for me to grasp. Oh, the hardest, so the hardest thing for you to grasp in your faith is like... The flesh and blood. Yeah. Well, that, makes, that actually makes perfect sense why that would be really hard for you to grasp. I encourage you to read John chapter 6. Because in John chapter 6, uh, most of the disciples, when they heard that, ran away. Like, in John chapter 6 is, is John's gospel's teaching about communion. Okay. John's gospel is amazing for many reasons. One of the reasons is that John's gospel is the only one in which at the Last Supper, Jesus doesn't institute, I mean, at the Last Supper, Jesus does not institute the communion. Happens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John's gospel talks about communion way more than any other gospel. In John chapter 6 specifically, you know, like this, you know, you, you must, if, if, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. And you go, what? Okay. So when Jesus said that to people, most of the disciples ran. Because they were like, you are freaking us out. And took off. So... It makes, so what I'm trying to say is it makes perfect sense that that would disturb you. Um, and it is, and if you enter into like contemplating that, it is pretty disturbing. And um, it goes back to the idea of sacrament generally, which is, in the idea of the Lord's Prayer generally, which is, how do you receive, I mean, how do we receive anything? We receive it physically. Right? Like God gives us grace, but he does it through the physical world. One the, th the thing about eating and drinking is we eat and drink to survive. Like if you don't eat and drink, you will die, right? So you eat and drink to survive. And in the same way, we eat and drink the flesh of the Son of Man in order to survive. Like he feeds us, uh, he feeds us spiritually through common bread and wine because it's part of the way we're created. We are, we are created to eat and drink to survive. We're created that we don't have life unless we eat and drink. And therefore, we eat and drink God 
in order for in order to live the life of God. I know, crazy, but that's how these are going to go. I don't really understand it myself. Right? Crazy. Well, I mean, he was. There's a lot of reasons why Cranmer, Latimer, Ridley were all killed. This is one of them, for sure. It was because it was because Queen Mary was re-Catholicizing, was trying, was attempting to re-Catholicize England, and you know, it is not a Catholic thing. What I said is not a Roman Catholic thing to say. Like I to say, like I don't understand how that works, you know. But I, but the kind of a of a. I, I don't have a philosophy of literalism when it comes down to, like the Anglican Church doesn't have a philosophy of literalism when it comes down to that. You know, uh, I once had an interesting conversation um, with a Roman Catholic priest and a Baptist minister who were talking about something. I can't remember what they were talking about. And I said, "What I said, what I find is fascinating about you guys is you're both literalists about completely different things." I was like, you, I was like, you Catholics, you're completely, you're literalistic about this whole like, this is my flesh, this is my blood, like, that's very literal to you, you know. And then you Baptists are really literal about the word baptismo must mean immersion, like you're really literalistic about that. I was like, it's really, I was like, wouldn't it be interesting if, you know, is there a church that's literalistic about both? I was like, I don't think so, but there's a church that's not literalistic about either. <laughs> so. <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, so, yes? Are those both sacraments? I'm going to go through both. I was all afraid. Are cool. those both sacraments that are administered through folks who are passed down through Baptist cults? No, they're sacraments because Christ did them and then commanded us to continue them. That's why they're sacraments. Um, in, in our way, um, uh, priests and priests, and then of course bishops, because they were, they were, they were also they're also priests, which is a, another conversation. Um, and men can celebrate communion, but any Christian can baptize in our tradition. Like we don't have a we don't have a belief that you know you have to be ordained to baptize somebody. So please, if you have a chance to baptize somebody, go for it. You know we like to do it in church. We we prefer it. Because we like to be able to celebrate baptism as part of the body of Christ. You know what I mean? Like, we prefer not to have private baptism. Like, we prefer to say, like, hey, you want to get baptized? Let's do it at church so everyone can be there and we can all celebrate together. You know, that's our preference. But we've got no qualm with baptizing. Like, go for it. You know, in your swimming pool or the beach or whatever you want to do. Have fun. But communion is. Communion in the Anglican Church, um, in our church, we like uh, only only or clergy, priest or bishop clergy, can celebrate communion. Now, does that thing does that mean we believe that if an Anglican clergy person doesn't celebrate communion, it's not really communion? No, of course not. That's ludicrous, right? So um, I like the sacraments of other churches. <laughs> we think that sacraments. Like I think that what happens is if here's what I think. I have the, I, I believe that. Things are what they are, regardless of what you think about them. Okay, so like, um, like a brick wall is a brick wall, regardless of what you think about the brick wall. Uh, in a similar way, I think communion is communion, regardless of what you think about it. And so, I think that when Baptists have communion, they're really having communion. Like, I really believe that. I think that they're eating the body and blood of Christ. Now, I know that they may take issue with my language, but I think that they're really doing that. Okay, it's seven thirty-five. Thank you all very much for being here. I hope you come back next week. Thank you, Carol, for that. That was really helpful. And God bless you all. Go forth and decide that this is not a good idea. <laughs>